And good evening, Flagstaff, and to all of you good people, wherever you may be. Uh, we're very grateful and excited that now we are beginning to get uh, viewers from the East Coast, West Coast, the Midwest. So we're very excited about that. As always, we're, we're excited to bring uh, a new topic to you uh, first. We uh, remind you that this is a lived Black experience project uh, in partnership with Flagstaff's Southside Community Association and the Murdoch Community Center. Uh, tonight, we're very pleased uh, to present um, what is often a hot topic in the Black community, um, when we talk about sports, um, but here lately we've added another uh, co-topic to sports, uh, race in sports. We're going to talk about this evening. We're going to talk about athletes and protests. Um, we're going to talk about um, and end up the conversation again uh, with race and sports. And so before we begin, I wanted to uh, share this uh, particular photo. It is a rare one. Uh, this is Dr. King in 1965, uh, kneeling in what we now describe as a prayerful uh, protest. This is uh, Selma, Alabama, uh, 250 marchers. Um, protesting um, for uh, voters' rights and for voter registration in Selma, Alabama. So that is probably the first time that we hear about a scene uh, kneeling in protest. And then when we talk about athletes uh, in protest, um, most people will be familiar with uh, the Olympics, I think it was 1965, uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith, um, they were uh, protesting for human rights, um, and they do the Black Power sign as a gesture um, of their protest and in solidarity. Uh, and then we see uh, Muhammad Ali, with the raised fist, the black power sign, and uh, this was also taken in 1965. This was his gesture of solidarity with Olympians John Carlos and Tommy Smith. And then the bottom photo um, is a group of athletes in protest. Uh, they're gathering around Muhammad Ali in support. Um, and uh, the boxer or Mr. Ali uh, was protecting the grass during the Vietnam War. Uh, and so here we have three examples of athletes and protests. Bringing it up to the present, um, Bobby Kopernick kneeling in protest. And I wanted to share this this evening because. Um, was it really kneeling in protest or was it kneeling in reverence of his love for America and wanting to make a change? And so that is what this conversation is all about tonight. And then we're also very excited to have a professional athlete uh, in on this conversation to kind of share his experience on what it was like to be uh, a professional athlete uh, who 
oftentimes we hear uh, these individuals have to deal with um, racism or discrimination, um, inequality in one way or another. So we're excited to hear from a professional athlete about their experience. And so, Sister Kara, the, the room is yours. If you would please go ahead and get us started. Thank you very much. Uh, up first, we have Dr. Jamal Ratford, who will be presenting on uh, Kaepernick and kneeling in protest. Dr. Ratchford is a professor in the Department of History and the Race, Ethnicity, and Migration Studies program at Colorado College. Dr. Ratchford specializes in African American history, uh, sports studies, and 20th century U.S. history. And his work explores synergies and discontinuities between sport and long term or, and long Black freedom movements. His work has been cited by The Guardian, NPR, and Salon. He has earned fellowships through the National Endowment for the Humanities at Harvard University, and most recently, the Kentucky Historical Society. Welcome, Dr. Ratchford. Thank you, Ms. House. I appreciate your very warm introduction. I want to thank uh, Madam Mayor Evans. I want to thank Ms. Lewis. Uh, I miss all of my Flagstaff friends and family. Love you all, and it's good to reunite with you tonight. Uh, we have a lot to cover and a little time to do it, um, so I'm going to get right to it. Uh, the, the title of, it's my working title of what I want to talk about tonight, uh, is, is Performative Patriotism, the National Anthem, and the Perils of American Knowledge Production. And the way in which I plan to organize this, um, and this is, I just want to say this is my first attempt um, grappling with some of the sub-themes embedded in that title, so gotta bear with me on that. Um, the way in which I want to organize this, I briefly want to talk about Drew Brees, give a little bit of, of, of national kind of context in terms of this moment that we're in, how I'm thinking about knowledge production, um, which includes service, military service. I'll talk a little bit about Kaepernick. I was asked to do that, so I want to ensure that I, that I at least give a little bit of coverage on, on Kaepernick. Um, and then I'm going to end with, with a little bit of dialogue on paid patriotism and my own thoughts, my own unique thoughts on the national anthem at this moment. Um, including sentiments that rarely, if ever, are covered in terms of our national discourse on the national anthem, some paradoxical uses of the, of the national anthem that are rarely are covered um, in terms of, of this conversation. I wanna start off with, with Drew Brees. If, if you're not familiar, almost three months ago, Drew Brees had a quote where he said something to the extent of, I will not agree with anyone disrespecting the flag of the United States or this country. And I, find, I found that quote to be a bit fascinating. It seems to me that Bree superimposes a uh, seemingly universal uh, imaginary of the flag uh, rooted in an American exceptionalism that privileges a particular master narrative of this nation. Uh, and what I argue is that we absolutely should discuss the flag. Um, that goes against the grain of what typically is put out there, but I believe that we should um, discuss the flag, including myopic, paradoxical, and exclusive definitions of American exceptionalism. We'll get back um, to that in just um, just a moment. I, I want to read you a piece from um, James Baldwin just to get us going. Quote, white Americans remain unable to believe that black America's grievances are real. They are unable to believe this, this because they cannot face what this fact says about themselves and their country. And the effect of this massive and hostile environment, hostile and comprehension is to increase the danger in which all black people live here, especially the young. Um, I think Breeze and what Breeze was talking about is incredibly fascinating for a couple of reasons. Just give me just a second I need to get myself back um, in line. Because he argues that the, the service and what, he, what his, his position is predicated on this belief that the service of his grandfather somehow defines uh, experiences on difference and equity um, in our armed forces from the first war um, of independence to uh, 2020. To him, um, those that served during World War II were the greatest generation and absolved from perpetuating injustice. So for him and for, I believe for a lot of Americans, they, people in the so-called greatest generation have become sort of flawless superheroes in our imagination. And I challenge that. Uh, for example, Jackie Robinson faced a court martial during World War II in lieu of his anti-racism protests at Fort Hood, of which he was transferred from uh, Fort Riley in Kansas, of, which he pranked, of, of where he pranked, uh, protested sport racism in sports specifically um, on their football and baseball teams. 
uh, numerous black intellectuals, intellectuals, including black writers that pushed for interracial baseball from the 1930s through Robinson wrote on the double V campaign during the same war, uh, Breeze glorify, glorifies in some subjectively universal way. All right, so black, so in other words, black writers linked World War II with their push for interracial baseball. Right. And they said, if the if the Navy can integrate, then why not baseball? This is the exact same period of time where Breeze has this particular type of romanticization of of his ancestors, of his elders. Um, so we need to think about that. I think we need to think very poignantly about uh, nationalism, myopic iterations of of um, American exceptionalism, as well as patriotism. I think this, this talk today is, is incredibly timely in the state of Colorado. About a, almost about a month ago, they declared racism as a public health crisis. This will not be a new um, piece of information for black people that have lived here. Going back, extending back to the 19 teens, 1920s of, of black citizens that infiltrated the Klan to try to gain intel on the Klan. We've seen a Hollywood depiction of this through black Klansmen, but black Klansmen was not the first iteration of an example, even in the state of Colorado. Uh, black women, black women and the roles of black women, for example, Justina, Dr. Justina Ford, who delivered thousands of black babies under the auspices of, of, seg of legalized segregation in Colorado. There were certain hotels that black people cannot stay at. If you read, if you were to read the transcript of Evelyn Stroud, who was a student at my institution, Colorado College, she mentioned her experience as a living hell. She talked about going to football games and hearing her white peers say the N-word to opposing black players while she sat in the stand and had to endure this. She talked about sundown communities of which black people could not go on certain streets after certain hours. In other words, they would face risk of danger, harm, physical harm, perhaps um, to be arrested or they could have been killed. She talked about blackface um, floats that happened during homecoming when CC would play uh, the University of Colorado in football in the 1930s and the 1940s and 1950s. Their experience was a living hell. Right, so this, this, it's a timely talk in many different ways, but it's also a timely talk in, in loot of, of where I'm trying to go today in terms of American knowledge production. If you remember just a couple or so weeks ago, might have been about a month ago, Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas pushed for this Saving American History Act in response to 1619, um, or of which he felt that, that, that the um, noteworthy and the journalism and scholarship in, uh, on the 1619 series of New York Times was troubling and threatened sort of American, traditional American values. I think we need to think about that. And his views were in concert with Arizona politicians, as you might have heard of, Tom Horn, John Hoopenthal, and many others, right? So uh, this particular type of imaginary, the sanitized type of imaginary that we hold true to ourselves. So for example, if you were to click on, type in George Washington right now, or type in Thomas Jefferson White right now, and go to whitehouse.gov, you would see a particular type of narrative that we are to consume as a population that allegedly represents um, American values, right? So George Washington was perceived to be trained in the military arts, this is per whitehouse.gov, trained in the military arts, or focused on the military arts as well as Western expansion, right? He, he, he was someone that valued self-determination, that could dig deep. If there was, he was someone that, um, of which where his soldiers faced uh, trouble in war, they were, uh, were ill-prepared, they, they were ill-resourced, and they were able to overcome the sort of, sort of, sort of toughness in, that, that were supposed to resonate in terms of the American populace um, if you were to read um, these sorts of terms. Uh, read the, sort of this page, right? Um, so if you see towards the end of, of, of uh, this particular page, or whether you're talking about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, George Washington in particular, he warned against excessive party um, spirit. So there's a particular type of narrative that we're supposed to process in terms of what it means to be an what it means to be an American. Similar for Thomas Jefferson, he inherited 5,000 acres. He was he was not a good public speaker at age 33. He was one of the writers of the Declaration of Independence, right? So you know he he founded he studied at William and Mary. He founded University of Virginia. So this is the particular type of narrative we're supposed to consume, particular what it's supposed to mean to be an American. So that's a good story. Americans like good, happy stories with nice, neat endings, right? Um, so it's not a good story to say that eight of our first 12 presidents owned slaves while they were in office. It's not a good story to say that 10 of our first 12 presidents owned slaves or that 12 presidents owned slaves or that 50 of our first 60 years owned uh, featured a slave holding president. In fact, just a day or two ago, there was an article that came out on John C. Calhoun, um, vice president of the United States, who said they, they, they were, uh, uncovered a, a burial site of over 200 plus uh, enslaved Africans. 
That's not a good American story, so we don't tell that story. The late Nathan Huggins, who was chair of African-American studies at Harvard, talked about this in the late 80s and the 19, early 1990s, right? Um, so what I want to do, do today is, is talk about the perils of American um, knowledge production and to take you on a journey to think critically and differently, hopefully, about this. I think American knowledge production is incredibly important. And, and what I do in my work is look at the relationship, um, of American knowledge production and, and their relationships with time, people, and space. And I argue that um, American knowledge production is received in a palatable uh, way that allegedly provides universal and objective truths about um, on individual, collective, and national identity formation, um, and that it frames American it frames tenets of American citizenship um, in ways that are supposed to be and allegedly universal um, and objective. And I challenge that um, very distinctly. Let me give you a couple examples of this. Excuse me. Okay, so when we're thinking about the, the anthem and when the anthem became sort of an, um, a national demonstration around 1918, right? That wasn't the first iteration of, of incorporating the national anthem in sport. In the World Series between the Cubs and the Red Sox, there was, an, there was a use in, I believe, 1862. The Navy around 1889 um, signaled that the national anthem was going to be a part of, of sort of the Navy's um, um, I want to say just celebrations, but Navy um, um, procedures. Um, the national anthem in sport really didn't become a thing, if you will, in terms of all professional sports until around World War II. But with that said, there was so there's always been a connection between war, which is a particular type of production knowledge, and the anthem. So if we situate this in, in World War I specifically, just a few years after World War I, in 1925, the Army War College confirmed racism in service at the federal level. And I'm going to read this to you. The 17 outline points framed under, quote, the opinion of the War College validated white perceptions of black mental, physical, leadership, personality, and pugilant inferiority, fighting inferiority, and subservience in military service. The black brain, hear this, the black brain was said to be 10 ounces smaller than its white counterpart. The finding proposed that the blood American Negro was inferior to our white population in mental capacity. This is the American War College shortly after World War I and shortly after an era, an era, and a moment where Americans, or at least so many of our white American brothers and sisters, were feeling sort of decimated, feeling down morally, so that the national anthem in 1918 was seen to uplift the spirit, uplift the morale of, of white American patrons who came to watch baseball. All right. But I think we also, concurrent to the sort of imagination of this particular type of imagination of, of American heroism, went alongside um, of subservience in, in, in suppression of black existence by our armed forces. This is very important, um, I would argue. And they were not the only example. I mean, George Washington initially did not want a black service in the Continental Army. Only once it was found to be a, a tactical advantage by Lord Dunmore did he change his strategy. There have been black soldiers who have been lynched in uniform, right? So I argue we need to question what is we need to really question these sort of myopic iterations of of service uh, and have the myopic iterations of how we think about uh, American patriotism in a way that's not singular in a way that breaks up master narrative. I think it's incredibly important. All right. Um, I think we also need to know that in 1940, 1943, there was a Supreme Court case. Um, Supreme Court ruled West Virginia versus um, Barnett that students don't have to salute the flag. All right, so I believe we're in this anti-intellectual moment as a nation where we don't think, uh, where we have people that have uh, sort of these opinions, uninformed opinions about everything, have never taken a class, have never read a book, have never read an article um, on anything related to difference. Whether that's African Americans, whether that's Latin, Latinx, Latina, Latina, whether that's talking about Native American, Asian American, people haven't read anything, but have opinions on these issues as if they're supposed to be quantify, quantifiable, empirical um, fact. Um, so in this very interesting anti-intellectual moment where people claim to know what it means to be an American and at the same time don't know anything about what it means uh, to be American, particularly to our lived experiences as a nation and our diverse and, and at times marginalized um, experiences as a nation. Um, and I think that's really important in terms of how we think about knowledge um, production. All right. I want to move forward just a bit in terms of how am I doing on time? I've been looking. Um, I want to move forward just a bit in terms of, of Kaepernick. Um, and, and on September 1st, I believe, 2016, Colin Kaepernick kneeled 
in a preseason game um, during the national anthem against the San Diego Chargers. Shortly after the fact, he was joined by Eric Reed, who's now a free agent. Who was he did last season play with the Carolina Panthers, um, and soon after that, at the at the high school, collegiate, and professional levels, even in politics, people kneeled all over the country. Okay, and in some places, in some cases, even globally. Okay. Um, you have to understand, it's in, I believe, 2013, Kaepernick led the San Francisco 49ers to the Super Bowl, um, in, albeit in defeat against the Baltimore Ravens. Um, said, you know, his, his numbers weren't the greatest um, following that Super Bowl run. So some critics suggest that um, Kaepernick is somehow an opportunist. I, I, I oppose that fundamentally. Um, he restructured his contract in 2016, uh, turning down um, a 2017 turning the 2017 season into a player option. He had a, um, he had a $126 million contract and it turned out he only received about a third of that, almost $39 million. He knew he was going to be released. He was optimistic that he was going to be signed. He was never signed. And since that point in period of time, there have been, I believe something, and I, this is from 2019 undefeated um, in terms of sourcing at least 115 quarterbacks that have been signed um, over Colin Kaepernick in this period of time. So you to think about this, some of these quarterbacks have never taken a snap they have never thrown a completion, not one yard, not one touchdown, have played in one game and have been signed. And some of these quarterbacks have been signed over him, have been signed multiple times um, since this period of time. Um, he was given a tryout. I have a lot I could say on um, kind of race and tryouts. I don't know where I'm, where I'm, where I'm at in terms of time. Um, there's a long, there's a, and I can answer this in Q&A if, if you like, but there, there's a long a trajectory in terms of anti-blackness and tryouts. And in our American sporting past, I'd be happy to talk about that in a variety of sports center during Q&A, if you would like. Um, um, and, but just to move us forward in, 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 in the sake of time, there was a collusion um, lawsuit by Colin, Colin Kaepernick, which was settled. We don't know what the final figure was um, to that. It, it could have been 20 million, could have been 50 million, could have been 80 million. People were throwing out numbers in terms of um, this collusion uh, settlement um, by, by Kaepernick. Um, just earlier this year. I'm going to push us forward just for the sake of time um, to where I want to end today in terms of thinking about knowledge production in a particular type of way. Um, following 9-11, if, 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 if you can remember, I remember this clearly because I was a sophomore at Morris College at the time. Um, following 9-11 in all professional sports, honestly, there, there is, this, is a, a rise a sort of meteoric rise of a particular type of patriotism um, that consumed the nation that has not, that has reverberated to this day. And it, it's been fairly controversial, believe it or not, even for veterans. There's articles you can read um, by our troops, by our servicemen and women who have commented very critically on what John McCain, late John McCain and Jeff Flake, both of Arizona and both conservatives, um, brought to the congressional floor on paid patriotism. So that in other words, there's been an attempt um, by my um, relationship, I should say, between our federal government, between specifically the Pentagon and um, professional sports to kind of force the hand at, at showing patriotism before games, for which thousands of dollars, I give you examples, have been paid. Millions, actually, between um, anywhere between four and a half to seven million dollars said by McCain and Flake um, have been paid to to force, if you will, a particular type of patriotism. In 2012, the New York Army National Guard paid the Buffalo Bills $250,000 to conduct on-field re-enlistment ceremonies. In 2014, the Georgia National Guard paid the Atlanta Falcons $114,000 to sing the national anthem. Um, in 2015, the Air Force paid uh, NASCAR $1.5 million in part for veterans to shake hand with racing legend uh, Richard Petty. And, and, uh, if you if you read some of these works, you, you'll see commentary by veterans who talk about this kind of this forced patriotism in a way that that's found they find disturbing, I mean, blatantly disturbing. Um, in fact, they say um, very pointedly that these these articles of war these, uh, that may perhaps be necessary. I'm quote I'm paraphrasing them may perhaps be necessary in terms of of uh, war context are being celebrated as if um, in a very leisurely in a very superficial type of way. Um, to represent some sort of imagination of of American patriotism, and that strikes not only me a certain uh, certainly no wrong way, but also strikes many in our armed forces and veterans a, a, a wrong um, way, including the late John McCain um, on this issue. 
Um, one of the last things I kind of want to talk about today, just for the sake of time, once again, um, thinking about the national anthem in, in a different kind of type of way, uh, I think is incredibly important. Um, you might, may or may not be aware um, of, of this, but there are numerous professionals, some college teams as well, that actually alter the anthem. Um, there's been criticism against this since at least the 1950s. I, the name escapes me, but he was the manager of the Baltimore Orioles in the 1950s who actually served. This is a white man who actually served in World War, World War, World War I, um, who had problems with sort of this forced um, use of the national anthem in a way that sort of lessened, um, watered down the the intention of uh, behind an anthem. And if you go back and even take that a step further in terms of Francis Scott Key being a slaveholder, having a relationship with Judge Taney um, of, of Maryland, who's who's the chief justice of, of Dred Scott. If you remember in Dred Scott, I believe it was something like seven of the nine justices that served on Dred Scott in 1857 were appointed by slaveholding presidents. Five of the nine actually were slaveholders. Right, so this is this is the context that we're talking about in terms of people that even came up with these anthems. But that the anthem, but that aside, um, think I want you all to think about just leaving leaving for, for me to leave today um, the ways in which we sort of alter many Americans sort of alter the spar the Star Spangled Banner in a particular kind of way. I know this, the St. Louis Blues, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, so at the point where it goes and the home of the many franchises will actually put in their own team at that moment. And I would argue that statistically, some of the same people that are critical of Colin Kaepernick kneeling alter their own, alter the anthem for their own, for the benefit of their own team. And there's no um, backlash against these fans um, that do this. Um, in fact, if you think about the Kansas City Chiefs um, rendition, and with it, um, um, there's a particular type of settler, settler colonialism embedded in the Chiefs rendition that is indicative of a broader problem and discourse blatantly hidden from public view and silence from. Uh, national media outlets and Florida Panthers take them. I'm going to read this the rest of this. Take the Florida Panthers last summer, the NHL team unveiled a new marketing marketing campaign called we see red. It includes new red uniforms, red seats and red flash and flashy red light lightning uh, lighting during games. Fans also now shout red when the anthem singer reaches and the Rockets red glare, right? Fans in Washington do the same during the Capitals games. They yell, Oh, at the phrase, oh, um, at the phrase, oh, um, oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave, which is a takeoff on what Baltimore Orioles fans um, have been doing for almost 40 years, right? University of Oklahoma football games, the crowd shouts Sooners instead of Brave when the singer sings the final line um, and the home of the Brave and fans at the University of Kansas and North Carolina State um, have done the same thing despite urgings from from school. So I, I, what we're not having, I, I'm just to sum it up this way. I, I do not believe we're having a, a, an informed type of conversation in terms of how we think about American knowledge production um, in very myopic sort of master narrative ways. We're certainly not incorporating experiences of racism, blatant anti-black racism in our armed forces that black people have faced to complicate the ways in which we think about um, American patriotism. And I also don't think that we're um, paying attention to the ways in which uh, this particular iteration of patriotism so sort of is enforced on us in, in, in a way, as I talked about, in terms of paid patriotism. And we're certainly not talking about what I ended on today um, in terms of, of um, renditions of the national anthem that have been butchered, openly butchered by thousands of people in these home stadiums that would, I would argue, are the same demographic that are critical of of Colin Kaepernick um, kneeling. So I'm going to end there. I'm happy to answer any questions on uh, Kaepernick, issues of the flag, issues of, of paid patriotism, or just race and sport in general. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Ratchford. Um, as a reminder to anybody who's watching us this evening, if you have questions for any of the presenters or on any of the topics that we discuss, please remember to uh, post those in the comments and we will make sure we get to those during the open Q&A. Up next, we are gonna hear from Dr. Jose Marino, um, who's gonna speak on the political significance of the 1968 Olympics, the Black Power protest, and Muhammad Ali's jail sentence. 
Dr. Marino received his doctorate in American Studies and Chicano Latino Studies at Michigan State University. He is a full-time senior lecturer in Ethnic Studies and Sociology at Northern Arizona University. He has organized, presented, and participated in various professional conferences and forums all over the United States and the world. Finally, he has published various publications, critical essays, and book reviews in the field of ethnic studies. Welcome, Professor. Okay, I want to do is uh, put the slide on. So let me do that here. All right, share. Okay, uh, hear me, everybody. Okay, first of all, thank you, uh, Coral Evans, uh, uh, Bernadine Lewis, and Dr. Ricardo Guthrie for inviting me to present. Uh, here, uh, this presentation today. I'm oh, sorry about that. And um, this is a project started when I was a teenager. My, my mom had a picture of Juan Carlo and Tommy Smith uh, you know, on the wall. I go, what, why, why do you have this for? Is it Black Power Salute? And she goes, well, she explained it to me what it was, political. So I started to have a fascination. So I read the, the Revolt of the Black Athlete. I went to the library and got the edition from Henry... Dr. Henry Edwards' uh, book on the Black Athlete Revolt, and I started reading it and started to study this topic. But it wasn't until um, my grad um, school experiences when I started teaching college sports and um, sports history with my colleague, and we, I started to look at, you know, again, you know, Juan Carlo, Tommy Smith, and the Revolt of the Black Athlete. Um, so um, I had a student there that eventually went to grad school. Now he's a um, professor too. And he um, recently invited me, uh, the American Studies Association has a, a sports caucus. So he goes, hey, why don't you come back and review some of the work you're doing on Juan Carlos? Well, I haven't done it in many years, or, or Tommy Smith, I go, but I'm willing to go back and look at it. So our caucus, our, the caucus invited me for this conference in Baltimore, but it got canceled because of COVID. So it's gonna hopefully resume, um, postpone 2021 and Puerto Rico. So hopefully I'll present this work so um, in the future. So I start out with the uh, 68, um, you see the photo here? Is, it was student movement that I wanna talk about. Dr. Gutcher wanted me to address the student movement in Mexico that protested the Olympics before I get into the meat of my presentation here. But let's go uh, to the first slide here. So in the modern era of sports production, the individual she meant has been highlighted of people of color athletes in the US empire. For instance, former NBA, um, Sports icon Michael Jordan became a global symbolic reputation during the last two decades of the 20th century. Historically, the black athlete has been exploited as a popular entertainment by the U.S. hegemonic class. This presentation will examine how John, Juan Carlo and Tommy Smith would challenge the U.S. Um, status quo during the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, Mexico. It examines how um, Carlo and Smith adopted the black power um, some water reputations at their medal center ceremony to protest global capitalism and imperialism. As a result of this, they were politically attacked by the hegemonic class for their protest actions and became global popular icons. In addition, this presentation contextualized how their political actions impacted the rise of the modern athlete protest production in the 21st century. Finally, it argues that Carlo and Smith revolt influenced the social construction of Colin Camlet political activism. So I'll make the argument that I think, um, you know, Colin probably, you know, studied, you know, Smith and studied, um, you know, Carlin because Colin was also Afro-American studies uh, minor at Nevada. So you got, he took classes in Afro-American studies. So you got to remember that too. So I think he had that knowledge uh, before he did that years later in, you know, 2016. Okay. So, Dr. Guthrie wanted me to talk about Mexico 68 and about um, the different issues that arose in the trans transnational perspective of Mexico and here in the U.S. So he wanted me to address more of that. So I added that to the presentation today. So 68 uh, was a critical year of global resistance and movements. And this transnational Mexican Chicanos still movement emerge on both sides of the border. Um, this is a protest of other issues. Um, you know, mess, uh, in, in the U.S., you have a, a mess, large Mexican population um, that protested for betterment of educational rights and betterment for the communities. And also it's cross-border. You had both, both Mexican 
population groups in both sides of the border, um, you know, organize with each other and collaborate with each other. And this is a, a motivation factor for um, the athletes, you know, too, because they're seeing this global resistance, um, the rise of this, these movements around, um, you know, the U.S. So um, you have the East L.A. walkouts here in the United States, which is student walkouts led um, months prior to the Olympics. Um, and also um, other walkouts around the, around the United States and the rise of um, various movements um, that portray, um, that organize around issues in the communities of, of people of color here in the U.S. Okay. So 68 Mexican student movement emerges to protest the 68 Olympics. Um, they felt that um, a lot of students and youth felt that they didn't have a say on the process of the Olympic process. And they felt all the resources were going into the Olympic games. And they were protesting the government. The government was very uh, one-sided, very um, very fascist um, government that was um, in, in power. And they started this movement in, in the 1968, around, I say, uh, April or March, after um, the rise of the French um, student struggle. And they started to uh, organize around the summer and early fall. Um, they organized this big, massive social movement that I'll show you pictures in a bit. So this massive movement of students and youth in Me around Mexico and Mexico City prior to the Olympic Games, um, you know, led to a repression. So um, the state repressed on them um, to destroy the movement because they didn't want to showcase this movement, the protest Olympics during the, the Olympic time. So what they did is repress and massacre people. They, ma they basically went in October 2nd, 1968, a few days before the Olympics, uh, they massacre, um, you know, various, about 300, 400 people under this massacre uh, Toto Loco, which is uh, the area in Mexico City where these students were protesting. And it caused a lot of friction. Uh, international press was able to see this pro um, repression so the Mexican government handled it in a way that was very brutal. Um, they didn't want to stop the protests, but they went and attacked them, you know, in a brutal way. And I'm going to show you the pictures. Some are very, not are very uh, visual. So I'm going to show you the pictures from the massacre uh, prior to the Olympic Games. Here is um, the protest in summer. You have the mass people, uh, you know, protesting. You know, I mean, for uh, against Olympics and for you know equal rights and different civil rights issues. And global, it's all, it was a global movement of global rights and all that, resistance and, against anti-capitalism. Here's a, you know, the mass movement picture here again, right in the eve of the massacre. So you had a large movement. It was very large of, of youth and students, um, you know, ga gathering momentum. That's what the government reacted to. Here's another picture of a big, uh, uh, from the event that I showed you in the other. So yeah, it's very mass movement. And this movement's forgotten. You know, uh, and, and, and historical analysis, you know, in the global movements, it was a large movement um, that, um, you know, was, you know, getting momentum before the repression hit. Here's the depression coming down, right? October 2nd, 1968. Um, you know, the, the, gov the, the army went in um, to basically brutalize people. And this picture here is when, when they start rounding people up and they shot them. They, they, shot, they shot people. And around one like this, and, and basically they had to go, they forced them to un undress. I'm not showing the, the, the other pictures. They're kind of brutal, but I'm going to show you one. Here it is. Uh, this is the one that came out in the international press. It was taken because you had the, at the time period, you had the media, ABC News. You had all these different news around the world there because they're getting ready for the Olympic Games, the cer opening ceremonies. This happened four days before the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. So Juan Carlo and Smith seen this stuff. Because they're there getting ready for the games and they're seeing the stuff they're hearing, probably reading newspapers and seeing the stuff's going on. So this is very massive. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go up the, and and move for that. But that's one of the avenues why um, you know uh, the global movements uh, that probably influenced Juan uh, Carlos and Smith. I would like to interview them and ask them what they thought about it because I've been looking for different opinions in their, in their memoirs and they haven't really explained how they felt about that. You know, seeing that, you know, um, being there in, in Mexico City time period. So I'd like to follow up with them, you know, to to get their perspective on this, those events, um, you know, go seeing, seeing what they've seen 
um, and then and, and doing what they did. It made, it made it, it motivated them more seeing, you know, the repression in their face, very brutal oppression, you know, but also they're influenced by black power. So what is black power? Um, that's just out there, you know, it, it shifts. The movement shifted in 65 in the death of um, Mar uh, Malcolm X and also the aftermath of uh, Sama. Um, it started to switch and then the rise of the Watts riots. So Carlo and Smith are seeing these riots, urban riots for about, you know, for a couple of years in various places, Detroit, Watts, uh, around ur urban centers. And they're seeing this stuff. So they're seeing the rise of, of uh, the Black Panther movement and the template program that's created from it. Huey Newton, Bobby Seals, they're seeing it more visually. So the year 68 and the death of King had a lot to do with um, this process here. So the, their ideology, their the, um, Smith and you know Carlos's um, background as African-American athletes and coming from these communities, they start to, to get conscious and black power is one of the formats why they did what they did. Um, and, and, you know, and, and protests of, of the global resistance of, you know, of the world. Okay, now I'm going to get to revolt of the black athlete. Uh, 50 years ago, this book was published by um, Dr. Edward, um, Dr. Edwards. Henry Edwards is, is um, you know, a long-term activist, scholar, uh, sociologist um, from Berkeley. At the time period, he was teaching at San Jose State. San Jose State was a um, track um, horse um, college where you had the best athletes. Tommy Smith, um, he met Tommy Smith there. Juan Carlos came later on. He came after the Olympics, but um, he he ran into, he started to organize around various um, you know athletes. And he was an athlete himself. And he went to Cornell for his PhD. He just got his PhD done in '68. So this was his first academic job um, after you know um, his, his PhD at Cornell. So he starts the Olympic Project for Human Rights. Him, Jackie Robinson, Martin Luther King, uh, Kamala Ali, and um, other athletes, um, you know, formulate this project um, to look at the look at the Olympics. Okay, the possibility maybe we boycott because of how African Americans are treated and other people of color are treated here in the U.S. in a time period of radicalism. Maybe we can push for a boycott. And Jackie Robinson was very, you know, supportive. Um, you know, to the younger athletes, because what Jackie Robinson faced, he was, Jackie Robinson was radical. He, you know, you talk a lot, you know, about, you know, radicalism, but he was very quiet, you know, in some, some avenues, but he supported, you know, the radical movements. Um, and they had his meeting in New York with King, um, you know, other people came, Lou Alcindor, which um, I'll talk about him in a little bit, um, and other people, and Juan Carlos was invited, because Juan Carlos was in Harlem, so he was invited to, to the process here. Um, so sorry about that. So um, that's how Juan Carlos got involved um, for this meeting. And they talked about boycott. And Muhammad Ali was there and they talked about supporting him because he's going through his case in 67. Uh, he's going through the, you know, he got, you know, he got, he got uh, drafted and he was fighting his case. And Muhammad Ali, I remember this uh, in an interview, he goes, in 1960, he said this, my gold medal means nothing. I came home, you know, to Louisville, Kentucky. And I basically got you got got basically back to Jim Crow, back to business. And he threw his gold medal in the river, um, in in, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. So he 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 had a you know a awaken of um, you know different civil rights issues you know that are facing, and he basically changed into a Muslim, um, you know the nation of Islam. He came out a Muslim, um, and so that was pur purpose important too. But also, uh, it was looking at the, at, at the revolt of it. So they met in, um, in, in 68. But what changed it, next slide here, was King. The death of King kind of kind of changed the boycott in April uh, because now athletes didn't want to do it. So Tommy Smith and Juan Cardo um, decided to uh, go to the trials in, in June of 1968 um, and find a different way to, boycott, to, to uh, push uh, you know, some type of protest. Luol Cinder, uh, which came Kareem Julia Bar later on, he decided to boycott completely. He decided not, not to go to the 68 games um, in the basketball team. He was a junior at the time period at UCLA. So he's the only one that really didn't go. He boycotted it. Um, and then Lee Evans, another uh, track star. Um, but they had the lack of support from other athletes like Bob Beeman he, and, and George Foreman. At the time, they, they also performed you know, at the Olympics. They didn't, want, they didn't agree with it. 
that they didn't want you know the boycott so they basically took a different stand and so what they came up with with, with smith and carlo was a silent protest so they worked with dr edwards and, and and lee evans and they decided to do some type of silent protest if they get a medal and that's what it came with the, with the black power salute um that in that process here here's um you know another picture of it a color picture uh, you see the black love you know you see the 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 different um you know symbols of it um they got nor they got the australian um sprinter norman um to be solidarity he got red baited for his um, actions by australia uh for supporting him um so you see this famous picture now it's internationally using the arena um you know black power uh, you know to talk about the global resistance global problems of people of color in society so this is global this is a global form um you know the olympics so this is a they're going to use a silent protest perspective okay so why make this political state uh, political statement globally why so smith and carlo later on reflected 50 years later that they did it because they did it no matter what and they wanted to show the world that um you know african americans and people of color were facing you know harsh conditions and facing you know the repression oppression repression from the state and they wanted to showcase that and they and they would and they reflected they would did the same thing uh 50 years later even though getting you know a lot of them lost their jobs you know lost a lot carlo had to work as a security guard most of his, most of his life after for a school uh smith you know got got some other speaking engagements but carlo wasn't really good with, 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 with studies so he struggled a lot. He worked you know, odd, odd jobs. Um, so both of them had split. I, I've been I researched a little bit um, on their, you know, the, the different documents. Both of them, after that kind of like a few years later, broke off from each other. And, but they re, they reunited each other. So what it means 50 years later? That's the conclusion. What it means? You have people like Craig Hodges, um, who wore Tatiki um, Bulls, took a stand. He was, you know, um, he went to Cal State LA, Cal State Long Beach. Excuse me. He studied, you know, you know, with black studies. You know, you have people like uh, Chris Jackson, became Muslim, got red, red baited. These are people from Fort Cam. So the other athletes have taken a stand um, before Cam and that did. And those athletes are forgotten, you know, you know, like, you know, and for their standing. And Kareem Abdul Bar, very, you know, vocal. So there's always been resistance to athletes before uh, Kavanick. But Kavanick was influenced by these athletes that, you know, but Calvin now because of the 21st century, Mark Cardo and Smith. So 50 years later, Cam becomes a symbol. Almost 50 years later, um, takes, takes that leap um, by kneeling um, the athlete after them, same thing in the Black Power Salute. So um, that's, what, that's what I'm trying to do is look at that, reflect on that, and I, I'm still working on this paper, um, hopefully publish it eventually. So uh, thank you. Um, for the time here. So I'll go back to um, the screen here. Share drive off. All right, thank you for the time. Thank you, Dr. Marino. There we go. <laughs> We appreciate the information. We look forward to coming back with questions for you during the uh, open question and answer period as well. Up next, we are going to have uh, a player's perspective, and we'll be speaking with uh, Mr. Carlos Bradley. Uh, Carlos Bradley is a retired professional American football player who played linebacker for six seasons for the San Diego Chargers and Philadelphia Eagles. Carlos Bradley is, a, is currently working as head trainer at the Aquatic and Fitness Center in uh, Bala Kinwood, Pennsylvania. He is also a fitness consultant and a health and wellness speaker for corporations. He is an executive vice president of International Student Athlete Academy, a 501c3 organization that has worked with student athletes for the last 23 years academically and athletically to empower them to be well-rounded human beings. As a member, Mr. Bradley is often invited to travel with the NFL Alumni Association around the world, entertaining and training troops. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All righty. 
Uh, I want to thank the guests before me and thank yourself and the mayor for allowing us to be a part of this wonderful program. Um, I just want to draw some, some parallels with the doctor mentioning the national anthem uh, coming into play in sports in 1918. Um, that was an interesting time because 1918 was the same time that Fritz Pollard was the first black coach mm -hmm. in the NFL, okay? So he was a player also. But then come 1926, himself and nine other athletes were kicked out of the league. No reasons given, mm -hmm. they kicked out of the league. So I'm kind of just giving you some thoughts on race, and then hopefully mm -hmm. at the end I'll together some things and my thoughts about that. Um, and also the parallels with the national anthem and just with the design of football itself. Okay. Then you, you moved on in football with um, players that were quarterbacks. And then there was always an issue on are black smart enough to play quarterback. You had Marlon Briscoe played with the Denver Broncos in the 60s, mm -hmm. then they moved him to linebacker. Uh, James Harris, who was the initial big-time quarterback, he actually was a teammate of mine and backed up uh, Dan Fouts when I was there. Um, but he was the quarterback that set the groundwork for Doug Williams, who became – the first black quarterback to win the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. which was in 1988. So you, there are a lot of parallels mm -hmm. with football and the military. Mm -hmm. A few years back, the military actually paid to be part of halftime and the opening presentation to the NFL. So that's why the, the tie-ins are there. But when you actually look at the game, if I could just take a minute and, and give you some things that aren't really talked about a lot with football. Football is designed a lot like football. A lot of football coaches were in the military. A lot of the military personnel became higher-ups in the NFL. And – the game is literally designed a lot like football with the flanks being the wide outs and the running backs and then the defensive backs. But the thing I find really interesting with this is down the middle of the field, safeties, middle linebackers, defensive tackles, centers, guards, quarterbacks, fullbacks, traditionally were all white. So even when they started letting players into the game, black players into the game, they were not at those positions. And why was that? Because that was considered, like in the military, that was how you control the power of the game. That's where you had the thinking positions, safety, calling the signals for the defensive backs, linebackers, particularly the middle linebacker, calling the signals, defensive tackles, controlling the line, centers, guards, controlling the offensive line, quarterback, the head of the offense, fullback leading the way on the offense. So I find it really interesting how the power of football, now it's changed because Football is 80% black now, but back when it was being formulated, down the middle of the field was white predominantly. And that's when it came into, is, the, is our blacks able to even be quarterback? Because they didn't think they could think enough to play quarterback. They let them play wide receivers and running backs and defensive backs. And oftentimes, up until the last decade, they really tried to change the black athlete from even wanting to be a quarterback. So 
I find all that very interesting, that the power struggle in football, bringing that to the power struggle with Colin Kaepernick kneeling. So as the, the doctor before me cited that in 2016, Colin Kaepernick started kneeling. Now, he originally started kneeling because of a young man being brutalized in San Francisco by the police. And so himself and Eric Reed took a knee, which we have to go back and talk about that, for race, racism and police brutality. All right, so Colin Kaepernick was sitting on the, on the bench and upset about what was going on. And Nate Boyer, a former Marine who had tried out with Seattle and the 49ers, told him, he said, you know, that's really disrespectful that you're sitting on the bench. So they had a con conversation about what would be respectful. And this is what I find interesting, how it got politicized. And then, you know, the president wants to say that he's disrespecting the military and the flag. Well, the former Marine, Nate Boyer, is the one that told Colin, uh, Colin the respectful way to show would be to kneel, opposed to sitting on the bench. I mean, sitting on, yeah, right, sitting on the bench. So he now he was kneeling in as a respectful way to protest. It had nothing to do against the military, and and getting all the way up to the president, I thought was absolutely ridiculous. But that's how and why he started doing what he did. That's why he gave up his last year of his contract. That's why, in essence. He gave up his career to make this point for racism and police brutality. So let it gets really convoluted and confused with a number of people on why he even did that. Uh, I find it very interesting and probably the first time the NFL usually exists. It's 2020, but they really kind of exist like it's in the 50s, like their rule or their laws rule the way they want it to be and not really up to speed with the times. So I found it very interesting during this civil unrest these past few months when uh, Commissioner Goodell actually, and for the first time I've ever seen him, apologize and say that they, they being the NFL, were wrong and were not listening to Colin Kaepernick and listening to the players of color that had this dispute and their stance on racism. And to actually say, the NFL actually to say we made a mistake is a huge, huge thing. They never, ever admit to being wrong to anything. So it's going to be interesting to see if football is even played this year and how it's played and if they're going to follow suit with the N NBA, with Black Lives Matter being part of their uniforms and uh, part of the floor. And it's going to be interesting to see if the NFL really shows and, and does something to move this mission along as far as social justice. So that's what I think of the Colin Kaepernick situation. That's what I think about the situation with athletes and the military right now. And I personally think even outside of police brutality, and I think something that needs to be talked about going forward is Black lives matter, as we all know, but black lives ne need to matter even more to black people in our own community because the black on black crime in America is completely off the charts. You know, we talk about eight P 
people that we know of that were killed unarmed by police. Somewhere in the statistics is somewhere like eight to 33 people we talk about. Well, in actuality, white unarmed people get killed at a higher rate. Yes, we probably get stopped and brutalized and all of that more, but what I really would like to see us moving forward as a people is start loving each other more and black on black crime ceased. That really needs, because that's thousands and thousands of lives and ways we're victimizing ourselves in our own community. So that's my stand, that's my point of view, and let's take it from there. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. We are going to uh, come back to you when we have a question and answer period as well. So please stay on for uh, when we get to that section. Right now, we are going to have uh, an overview of race and sports from Dr. Frederick Gooding or Dr. G. Uh, Frederick W. Gooding Jr. is an associate professor at Texas Christian University's Honors College in Fort Worth, Texas. Gooding critically analyzes race within contemporary society. His book, American Dream Deferred, Black Federal Workers in Washington, D.C., 1941 to 1981, carefully details the unknown growth and unheralded struggles of Black federal workers in the post-war era. Welcome back, Dr. G. Oh, you're muted. There. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank there you. There you go. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you once again for hosting me and for hosting this presentation. And props and respect to all the freedom fighters who spoke before me this evening. Um, speaking of which, I have brief comments as people want to get to the Q and A section, so I don't want to stand in the way of that. But in terms of an overview, uh, just three brief points. Firstly, we must understand that there is always been a vacillating opinion with respect to the relationship of African Americans, especially as viewed through the lens of sport. What am I talking about? I'm talking about white America has vacillated and oscillated between the two poles of fear and fascination. This is the problem, people. This is the problem, okay? So through the vein of sports, what we see is, let's talk about fascination. In so many ways, I mean, after all, the NBA playoffs are on right now. You have white people, well, most Americans, who will pay good money to be at the 50-yard line, to watch, you know, the players. And, you know, and, and, and notice, when we're talking about the game, football and basketball takes on a different context than, say, baseball and hockey in terms of when you look at, for example, for those of you who follow uh, football, uh, there is a... Um, uh, you know, all these tweets that were, were posted about this rookie uh, running back for the, uh, the, the Green Bay Packers. The reason why? Because of this fascination over the size of his thighs, his physical being. Again, uh, maybe someone can look it up right now. The, the, the brother's name escapes me. He's a rookie. But the idea is that there's all these pictures and posts and tweets and even articles written about the size of his thighs, right? This fascination. And again, we don't see or hear this being reflected in a similar manner when it comes to how we describe our baseball players or, 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 excuse me, dare I say, our U.S. women's national soccer team. Can you imagine if we fawn and describe their bodies and talk about how their legs look like you know, tree trunks and, and analogize them to animals, how offensive that would be? I mean, clearly, you know, you can't talk about white women that way. But yet, when it comes to black men, there's this fascination, right, over the body, how the body can perform, right? And so, especially in basketball and football, there's this emphasis on the strength, the build, the size, the speed. And even when the, you have these criticisms over taking plays off and things of that nature, it's all about the fascination of how the body should perform. And the unfortunate part is, if the body does not perform, then that changes the dynamic of the relationship. Look at the tight end, uh, excuse me, the defensive tackle for the Cowboys, excuse me, former defensive tackle for the Cowboys, Jerome McCoy. 
The day after he ruptured his uh, quadriceps, he was cut from the team, right? Just that simple. Can't perform, you're done, right? And so I think the other poll is very important for us because fear is what comes into play when you look at the dynamic of power involved. You see, I have so many white people who tell me that they're friends with the cafeteria worker. They're friends with their gardener. They're friends with the help. Notice the power dynamic, right? Notice the power dynamic. But see, what's so very fascinating is when you flip the power dynamic, how that changes matters. So I say this to say what? When you have a mostly, uh, because here's where, even though we're talking about like the brother, uh, uh, go fly, go fly, by the way, brother Bradley. Uh, before we was talking about, um, you know, players dominating, this is true. African-Americans do dominate in terms of basketball and football, but where do whites dominate? Well, they dominate in three key areas, ownership, sponsorship, and in-person viewership, right? That's where whites dominate. So oftentimes what you're doing is you're packaging these black bodies to sell to mostly white people with money, okay? I mean, I, I love basketball, football as well, but I can't afford to be by the 50-yard line. I mean, you know, just I have a family of four. I mean, just parking alone is going to set me back, let alone the tickets and God forbid, you know, somebody wants something to eat, right? And a program. So the, the fascination comes in the idea that I'm still in control. So you run up and down, you down the way I want you to, and I'm entertained by this. But see, remember the malice in the palace, you all? This is when uh, Ron Artest, remember the, the Pacers at the time, you know, went into the stands at the Detroit Pistons. That's the fear, this idea that this big, strapping, strong black male all of a sudden turns all that anger and aggression and all that power towards you. That's when you have a problem. But very reminiscent of what Dr. Joy DeGroote talks about, the post-traumatic slave syndrome. Yes, I went there, post-traumatic slave syndrome, right? The idea that black people out there in the fields working from can't see in the morning to can't see at night. And so they understood and knew that if I took the chains off, I had a problem. I, they understood that. If I take the chain, I have a problem. This person has 2% body fat and have every reason in the world to revolt against me. I must retain power. And that's how where the money comes in, okay? This leads me to point number two. So we're talking about the fear fascination poll, okay? But that leads us to point number two, which is the value of black bodies. It is unmistakable that William C. Roden was on to something. He's a New York Times columnist. He wrote a book called $40 Million Slave. And that title might be appropriate today. Now again, now again, I, I can hear, I can hear people shifting uncomfortably in their seats. Oh, Dr. G, you can't say that. You can't say that uh, the NFL is like slavery. You can't say that. These people get paid. I, I didn't say that. He did. He wrote the book. So read it and then dispute him. Send him an email. He works for Undisputed now. But what I'm saying is that the analogy is something that requires interrogation, right? This idea that you breed, excuse me, that you uh, select the biggest, the strongest, the fastest, you literally inspect them. But check it out on your, on your own, NFL combines. There are portions where they are inspected in rooms with nothing but skin tight underwear on, right? When was the last time you had a job interview where you had to skip down, strip down to your skivvies to see if you were deemed appropriate for the job, right? And so this is still taking place. You can look it up. There's all these metrics in terms of measuring the efficiency of NBA players and NFL players, whether they're taking plays off or not. But the value of black bodies is unmistakable. The value of black bodies is unmistakable, right? And look, I'm just gonna be honest. Uh, as, uh, uh, as Kara you know, House mentioned, I work at a university, which is a pre-WI, predominantly white institution. It's called Texas Christian University. It's in Fort Worth, Texas. Now, what's so famous about Texas Christian University? Well. Many of you may have heard about Texas Christian University through their what? Football team. They're part of the Big 12, one of the Power Five conferences. And the fact of the matter is, is that football is what's financing not just TCU, but thousands of other college campuses, right? Black bodies are financing new growth of buildings, new professor salaries, right? And paying for my white brothers and sisters to play on the golf team or equestrian riding or rifle shooting. These are non 
non-revenue generating sports, right? And they came up with Title IX, you have to be equitable, but they take that money that's generated from football and distribute it to all these other sports, right? So that people can pursue their hobbies or crafts or sports. But let's make no mistake, football is king in terms of revenue that's being generated. And so the value of back bodies is still very much at issue, right? Still very much at issue, right? In terms of what the back body can generate. And I think that yeah, leads me to my, my last point because I would love to you know, hear some questions is um, because, we, because and I think what's very unique about the college setting before I go to my third point is that um, when you look at the pro setting, revenue is being generated. But I think what's so very fascinating is that the studies show, and you can look at the 30 for 30 ESPN special called Broke, much of that capital that's generated by these black bodies does not stay within the black body's household or within the black, right? It's almost akin to, you know, and again, don't blame them like, oh, they should be making better decisions. Well, honestly, the statistics, the data lines up with that of lottery winners, right? Those who come into money very quickly. And oftentimes many problems are, you know, soon to follow. And oftentimes they're without the money within a short period of time, right? The average NFL career is less than four years, right? And so think about you've been working all your life for this, right? 20 years sometimes, right? Waiting for this moment. The idea is that that's been exclusive focus, right? This idea of, oh, I'm going to make it to the league. And so oftentimes, individuals are ill-prepared. My brother can talk to you about that, right? For the many nuances and traps that are set for these players in terms of them returning that money right back, right? You know, and so when you talk about the value of black bodies, many people understand this cycle very much so and are waiting on the periphery, waiting, right, for this phenomenon to happen year after year after year. Remember, the Shaquille O'Neal's are the exception to the rule, right? You know, um, the Daniel Thomasons are the exception to the rule, right? But what we're talking about is this conveyor belt whereby so much capital is being generated by the black body and so many whites are benefiting from it, right? Whether it be side businesses or directly as the owner, right? Because think about it. If someone's getting paid millions of dollars, as in Patrick Mahomes getting like, what, half a billion dollars? Well, how much is the owner making if he can afford to pay one person that much money, right? In addition to 52 other people on the team, in addition to staff, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, fact, you know, and, and coaching staff. But the third point is this, though. I think when we talk about race and sports and that connection and that relationship, it is also indisputable that Black people have done nothing less then amaze and marvel the world, right? Look at Usain Bolt breaking the record while, while tapping his, his chest and, and looking back. I mean, you, I mean, who knows? I mean, the, the record could have been even lower had he you know, just ran straight through, right? So not only to do something phenomenal, but to do it with this combination of pizzazz, flair. Think about the Willie Mays catches, right? You know, or, or, or think about you know, just even y- y- yesterday, Manny Machado c- catching the ball over his left shoulder. So not only do we do the difficult or the impossible, but we do it with this flair, right? Or the brother just mentioned Muhammad Ali, you know, just, just the way he completely revolutionized, you know, how people approach, you know, boxing and their showmanship, right? And so black people have continued to amaze. But here's my, my, my piece on that, right? Um, because this is where the, not black on black, but the black on white violence, I think is, is paramount. The failure to recognize not just the athletic body. No, 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 you have it all wrong. If you think that sports are just a manifestation of the body, then I think you're incorrect, right? What you need to do is play a sport. And you'll see very quickly that in addition to the body, it is a marriage of the of the human mind, of the intellect. I mean, think about how I'm tracking the ball in the air. Uh, Ms. Bernardine, you're muted. Did we maybe lose Dr. G? It looks like it may have frozen up there. Um, While we wait for him uh, to come back, um, why don't we go ahead and take a few questions um, from the community? Absolutely. 
So we have had a couple questions come in. And the first will be for um, either Dr. Ratchford or, or Dr. Marino uh, that talks about um, how the backlash facing uh, Colin Kaepernick, if it may merely be a means of avoiding addressing the issues that are protested. Uh, I think the, the question comes down to often seeing that shift from the issues uh, that are at hand uh, and the problems that are being presented and shifting the focus to, instead of addressing those, addressing the means of protesting the problem itself. So can either of you talk a little bit about that tendency when it comes to protest both in sports or in general within the Black community? Um, Sister Kara, please forgive me. We'll answer that one question and then we'll go back to Dr. G's uh, presentation. Thank you. Yep. Dr. Moreno, do you want to go first? You go ahead, Jamal. You can go first and then I'll emphasize it a little later. Re reiterate, sir. Can you can you just reiterate that question one one time? Are we talking about backlash against Kaepernick? Yeah. So it was the question itself was: Is the backlash facing Kaepernick merely a means of avoiding uh, addressing the issues protested? So I think the the heart of the question comes down to the fact that there's often that shift away from the problem to focusing on. Uh, the means of protest. So instead of talking about the racism or the issues that he was protesting, the focus became kneeling is disrespectful to the flag or is disrespectful in general. So the question is asking why that shift happens and, and how we use that shift to avoid addressing the issues themselves. Yeah, thank you for thank you for the question whoever asked it. So there's there's a couple things that I want to say. One in tandem with what Dr. G was talking about. And one thing that I always tell my students is that there's a fascination with blackness mentally, physically, sexually, violently, psychologically, we construct it as criminals. And sometimes that fascination coalesces in a concentric way. So at all, at the same time, all of these types of perceived, imagined perceptions of what blackness is supposed to be has held true not only today, but I argue through our national consciousness. So I think that's one point I think we need to be clear on in terms of how Kaepernick is perceived. And he's not the only person that, I, that we could talk about, whether it's Cardell Jones um, I think Cardell Jones was quarterback for Ohio State when Ohio State, I think there was, he was their third string quarterback. And I remember some of the tweets that um, he got from Ohio State fans. I don't remember exactly the context, but he was speaking out against something in terms of racial inequity, racial justice. And one of his own fans um, labeled him in a way, well, just stay in your lane. You're supposed to be a particular type of, of, of athlete. You're not, in other words, blackness is supposed to be palatable. And this is what I argue my work in terms of integration as a misnomer, right? I mean, I, I argue when integration as a, a, as a praxis that was shaped by our white brothers and sisters in terms of how it was executed, was put in place. You got to ask these questions. What was integration? How did it work? And who was it for? And I argue it was for our white brothers and sisters. It was for white citizens in terms of the execution of integration. Because there's, there's a palatable type of blackness that is, um, if whether we look at Jackie Robinson or a number of, of black athletes, that has been consumed as acceptable. So we don't process the Jackie Robinson that stood up and did the exact same thing in a very different context that Rosa Parks did almost 12 years before. Jackie Robinson was a hothead, he spoke his mind. He wrote letters to Vice President Nixon in terms of Little Rock Nine, right? We don't wanna process that Jackie Robinson. We don't wanna process that Jackie Robinson that spoke out on, on boycotting the 1968 Olympic games because of, of, of apartheid in Southern Rhodesia and South Africa. We would, so we, we want a process to turn the other cheek, Jackie Robinson, that was pushed forward by Branch Rickey. And also Branch Rickey is perceived as sort of the architect, architect of this, this imaginary of what I call participatory integration in sport. So we silence by extension even the black press. Okay, so that's kind of a minor detail to the question in part one. The other part in terms of answering the question in terms of what I, I kind of had to rush through my presentation a bit, so I, I do apologize. But what I'm trying to get at in terms of knowledge production that I think I, I hope gets at the, 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 the crux of your, your very good question. Um, I think knowledge production is incredibly important, incredibly powerful, incredibly potent. Uh, there's a particular, I would argue there's a particular type of story of American exceptionalism that we process and consume as acceptable. Right? And we process and consume a particular type of narrative on uh, what it means to be an American, what it means to be exceptional, what it means to be a patriot, 
in a very particular type of way, right? So it, there's a particular type of, I would argue myopic imaginary of patriotism represents X, support of the troops in some kind of way. I'm a product of a military from many, many people that have served. So don't get me wrong with what I'm saying, but I, I think there's a myopia um, in terms of how we think about American patriotism, how we think about American knowledge production. And I also think we're at this very fascinating moment in our national consciousness um, in terms of coverage on, on, on sort of these master narratives and where we have this coalescing of, of people that are waving Confederate flags, that are white nationalists, or in other words, that are people that believe in a, in a, in a homogenous white nation state. There are white supremacists who believe in white governance in that nation state who have coalesced in a way that's almost similar to the 1920s of, of the, under the auspices of true Americanism of the second wave of the KKK as the, the, the guardians of what it means to be an American. So anyone that pushes back against that is perceived as un-American, even though, as Mr. Bradley was pointed out, in terms of explaining um, um, that the purpose of, of Kaepernick's protest was intrinsically American. I mean, J James Waldman talked about the same thing in a different kind of context in terms of criticizing the nation to improve the nation. Right? So as Americans, I argue, we, we don't process um, iterations of what it means to be American that are so intrinsically American at the same time. Anti-Black violence is intrinsically American, sadly to say it, but it is. So we don't process any, any sort of attempts to refute that claim. Right. So, I mean, I find it I find it fascinating when we talk about and this is a bit tangential. If we talk about violence and race and pathologies, and I don't think pathologies are a helpful way to understand human existence at all. But if we look at our white brothers and sisters, if we look at the first war for independence, if we look at the Civil War, if we look at World War One or World War Two, these were our white brothers and sisters against our white brothers. They were killing each other. Yet there's no pathology that white people are fundamentally violent. And I'm not saying there should be. But I find it fascinating how we pathologize black existence for responding to a culture and climate of violence in a variety of capacities. And I had to rush through my comments in a way um, where I sort of break this down in a multiplicity of ways um, in terms of this fascination of blackness. So I'm going I'm to stop there. Um, if, I, if I didn't answer the question, I'd be happy to, to circle back. Please let me know. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to take a, a bit of a pause from the questions and we're going to go back to Dr. G uh, so he can finish his presentation. And so uh, Dr. G, take it away, whatever you had uh, remaining for your portion. No, certainly. I appreciate it. I mean, you know, the conspiracy just got involved, y'all, so I'm, I'm glad we were able to get the connection through. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, the last point I was trying to make was we are so creative. It is mind boggling. OK, but I think what people end up misperceiving is that they only see a lot of our creativity as translated through the physical form, through sports and entertainment. And therefore, mistaken they can believe that we are only limited to be sports and entertainers. My argument is the cure for cancer is where? Somewhere in the ghetto. But we'll never know about it because oftentimes we're limited in terms of giving these false choices as far as believing that that's the only cup that we can pour into the way the system is designed, like just like uh, Brother uh, Ratchford was saying, saying, Dr. Ratchford was saying, this idea of um, your blackness can be performed and accepted if you will you know, exercise grit, determination, and, and do extra hard work, so long as it's going towards this idea of your body being in position to produce for somebody else, right? But being able to use all of that creativity and, and, and what have you to actually, you know, within the science fields or in architecture, those, those routes and avenues are far and few between, right? And again, all you have to do is go to any college campus and you will be amazed at the facilities out there in terms of, you know, the type of chairs they have, the type of chirotherapy they have, the type of food they have, you know, in terms of making it possible. I mean, right, isn't this amazing to show love to black bodies, right? Isn't that amazing? I mean, imagine if that same type of investment was made, right? You know, in every other aspect of black lives, right? You know, then, you know, it'd be an entirely different scenario. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about the fear of fascination polls, because, again, so long as I'm performing for your entertainment and you're largely in control and can profit off of this, then we're cool. But the minute I step out my lane, I'm supposed to what? Shut up and dribble. 
Read, right? That's what that's what Laura Ingram told LeBron James, right? Now he's supposed to shut up and dribble. Can you imagine if he told her to shut up and stay in the kitchen? It would be, you know, it would be over. Game, game over, game over. Um, and lastly, when you talk about this idea of, you know, how this ties into, you know, protests and things of that nature, again, I think athletes have uh, wisely recognized that, um, you know, they do have a disproportionate amount of attention upon them and therefore are looking at ways in which to leverage it. I do have questions over whether the current NBA uh, you know, model is just simply uh, being agile, you know, to uh, simply go with the flow. After all, uh, you know, my, Chase Bank, you know, was celebrating Juneteenth this year. You know, oddly in the, the previous 40 something years of my life, they never celebrated Juneteenth. But all of a sudden, Chase Bank and, you know, Beth Bat, Bat, Bat Body and Beyond was celebrating Juneteenth. And, you know, all, all these corporations all of a sudden, because why they're agile, you know, the idea is that they want to do whatever is necessary to keep the money flowing. Right. So I questions. Um, that I guess time will tell is the answer in terms of whether the NBA is absolutely sincere. After all, the NFL just hired its first ever black president, team president, right? The Washington football team, right? And it's, and it's no, I don't think it's a far reach to connect the dots in terms of the, the, the immediate aftermath of the protest, them changing their name and then deciding that they're going to you know, advance and champion diversity. But my last point was this. When you talk about athletes being um, cognizant of you know, the, the spotlight that's on them, um, you know, I, again, I, I think, you know, we, we have to uh, look at what, what Brother Rashford was saying, you know, and going back to what Dr. Moreno was saying about, um, you know, other activists over time, right? To what degree is, it, uh, is the activism being commodified? To what degree is the activism, you know, truly organic? You talk about disrespecting the flag. I'm about to share my screen with y'all real quick. And I don't know if y'all ready for this. I don't know if y'all ready for this. When we talk about disrespecting the flag, can y'all see that? Can y'all see that? Yes. Can y'all see that? Can y'all see that? Can y'all see that? Yes, can we can see that. that? I mean, that, that that's, 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 all, that's all I'm saying. That, when you talk about disrespect, directly to maybe some of the other people, but I think most of what you're saying. What's the pathology in this? What's the pathology in this? Obviously, you know, him dress, the, the bad man dressed in a three-piece suit wasn't protection enough. That wasn't protection enough. If you want to play respectability politics, if you want to play that game, that wasn't enough. What's the pathology in this? Oh, because, oh, like Bradley said, upon counsel with a white military male, you know, decided to take a knee. I thought it was more respectful. People kneel when they propose. They kneel when they get knighted. They kneel, you know, as a sign of respect. You know, then when I do that, that's too much. I'm disrespecting the flag and the military. And police. What about this? What about this? Choose. Let's not play a game. Let's be consistent. Peace. Thank you very much for that. We're going to go into our question and answer period. Uh, and up first, I have a question for uh, Mr. Bradley, who I'm also going to just take this moment to acknowledge as my uh, Uncle Carlos. So Uncle Carlos, uh, I want to take a, a minute to talk a little bit about the work that you are doing now. Um, we had a little bit of discussion about athletes having that unique place um, in the American landscape. And going back to the idea of sports figures as heroes or role models or American icons, I think it's important that we look at the place of black athletes in society and the work uh, that they do to create positive change um, in alignment with some of the, the protesting that's going on. So can you share some of the work that you are doing, uh, both with the International Students Athlete uh, association in the Philadelphia area throughout Pennsylvania uh, with the NFL Association, any of that sort of work that you are involved with. And you're muted right now. There you go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear can you, you now. Hear okay. So I find it very interesting that the social justice movement now as everyone listening a little more. When white people kind of saying, oh, I need to listen to my black friends. I found it very interesting. And everyone wanting to get out and do something. Well, since I retired, two of my friends and I, we started an organization called the International Student Athlete Academy, which is to help 
student athletes academically and athletically to become well-rounded human beings. And why do we do that? Because over 80% of women in companies have played high school and or college sport. And men in higher uh, executive roles are 85 to 90% in, in those roles, they played high school and or college or further in sports. So what we thought was that the athletes should be and are the leaders in our community. So we, myself, Dr. Joe mm -hmm. Craig, Fred Dukes, Antoine Graham, we've tried to formulate an organization which helps them to be more responsible, to be leaders. We've been doing this for 25 years. We've helped over 3,000 student athletes get to college. And so building leaders, giving, giving people an opportunity to further their education through athletics, to use the athletics to further your life and your family and your career, but not let the athletics use you. Because you can be used up very quickly in sports. Uh, the, the good doctor earlier was saying that the length of a pro career, well, the length of a pro career, the NFL career, is two years now. Two years. Pension is at three years. When I was playing in the 80s, pension was at four years. Okay, the average career then was three years. That's all part of the program. 150 players make pension a year, period. That's why the owners have meetings to say, these people got to go. That's why two, three times a year they have meetings. So what we want the student athlete to realize is use athletics to further your education so you prosper in, mm -hmm. as a person in your family, help your family to go further. That's what we do in our charity. And some of the work I've done overseas is – I've gone to several company, I mean countries, Iraq, Iran, uh, Bahrain, Kuwait, and I've, I've worked with the troops in fitness related um, situations, but also to enlighten them. It, you know, it's amazing how uninformed the soldiers are. They often don't know what they're doing there even in that country, you know, it just becomes a job to them. So oftentimes it was just sitting around after our entertainment pieces and just informing them on what's going back, what's going on in our country and why they're even there in that country. Did I answer your question? You did. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to go back to Dr. Marino, something that you said that was uh, looking at sports figures as social icons uh, or otherwise elevated public figures. It seems that we're often okay with what athletes um, have to say that support certain narratives, uh, but not when they stand or kneel uh, when it comes to protest. So what is the role of the athlete in public narratives and how should we view them when it comes to protests and social movements? Well, you know, as an athlete, you're, you're a citizen too, to, you know, to your community, you know, I'll give you an example. You know, I was recruited by a lot of, you know, schools to go to college and play football. I decided not to do it because my conscience got to me and I got enlightened, you know, me to, uh, you know, go to school only. So I decided not to go play football and get a scholarship. I denied it. Um, but, it, it, it's it's a property draft, you know. I mean, uh, so people get you drafted, you know. They go they go to college, and they go, you know, go they're gonna try to get NFL, and it's about money to their families, and that's why they get people get caught up in it. But when that's okay, people, society, the state wants them to just to focus on that. But when they're political and bring issues up in the communities, they get red baited, and that's what happened to a lot of athletes. You know, Cam's not the only one. There's a lot of people that got red baited. And decided they lost their careers because of the political decisions they made. And, you know, a lot of them, you know, were, were very active in the communities. Um, and some of the athletes like Michael Jordan now is coming out now saying supporting these causes. But he, he was before he, he wouldn't do that. 
you know, it was all about the money. You know, he said Republicans, you know, buy sneakers. So um, he's a big icon, you know, in, in, in the globe. But, um, you know, yeah, so some athletes will do it. Some won't do it because they lose, they lose revenue. But when you do it, you know, you know, uh, the protests, you know, you're not you're going to get red baited and you're going to lose you're going to lose your career um, because you're making a big, you know, because you're making a big spectacle um, and making this, you know, and basically you're bringing because you have a, you have that you have the form to do it. But most people don't have that form, um, you know, and that's that's why, you know, you have like when Cardinal Smith had that form and, and did what they did. Um, you know, they had the support of you know, various people to do it. Uh, same thing with Kamenek. You know, he got, he, um, you know, took some classes, you know, and, and as in college, he got, you know, he started to get aware of it. And he started to get, you know, they were basically, you know, red baiting him too. They were basically criticizing the way he dressed after a game. He once wore a suit after a football game. He had a hoodie on, you know, interviewing with, with you know, with Beats. And they're going after already tattoos. They're already attacking him already, you know, for many years uh, personally, you know, the way, you know, the way he conducted himself professionally. You know, supposedly, you know, and um, and then he one day, you know, he decided to make take a stand, you know, on, on that. And other actors did the same thing. You know, I mean, um, you know, and you know, it goes back to that book, you know, forty acre, 40, 40 million, you know, slave, you know, um, and it's, it's, that's the way it is. You know, I mean, um, you want to make the money, we'll give you the money, but if you if you go against the state, you're gonna, you're basically going to get, you know, what I mean, red baited and get, you know, what I mean, taken away what you have, and you know. You're right. Most actors are broke, you know, I mean, because they don't they have to get they have credit when they start, you know, um, you know, inside contract, they're on debt already because they owe money because they get they borrow off 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 their contracts. That's why they're broke too. another factor of that. So that's what they want, you know, and, and, and you know, Dr. Greg bring that up, you know, but, um, you know, too. And, and but they, they don't want you to protest. That's why they don't want you to do that. You know, they want you to be good citizens, you know, according to them. But I think it's necessary for, for athletes to use the form. To be, you know, to um, go and they could take a stand for what they believe in. Can, can I just add on to what Brother Moreno just said? Will, will we think, um, so, uh, same concept. He uses red baiting. I use the term black ball, right? And I, I think that what happens is this, right? Question Do most of our ballers, like the, the ballers of NFL and NBA, do most of them come from upper middle class or upper class environments? The answer is no. So here's the here, so here's part of the conveyor belt that we're talking about. Dirt develops dependency, right? So what what what's happening is is that the NFL and NBA are preying upon the the least of these, those who don't believe that there's any other option, right? I mean, Moreno was just talking about how Kaepernick and even himself. They was able to gain that knowledge of self through education as a way to say, you know what, maybe there's alternate paths. But so many of us believe that that's the only, that's what I was saying earlier. That's the only cup I can pour my life force into, right? That's the way the game is quote unquote rigged, right? It's like a carnival game, right? Where you, you have the chance of winning, it's palpable. You see some scattering evidence of people walking around with the big giant, you know, stuffed animals. So somebody won. But chances are, when you get up there to th you know do your chance, chances are you're not going to win, right? You know, it's just the odds are against you. But the idea is that the most desperate. I mean, think about the way people play. You know, I mean, you have to be hungry to 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 be able to play a certain way in terms of you know running through your opponent. I mean, think about how cathartic football and basketball, especially, can be, right? As opposed to say baseball or hockey. This idea of when I dunk on you. Right, that is me exerting my will against you. I finally now have power and control over my, even a small, for a small period of time in a small area, right? Or even like in football, this idea I'm able to out elude and outwit and outmaneuver, or even overpower people who are trying to get in my pathway for my goal is is very cathartic in that sense. But going back to the points made by everybody else, cost, right? You know, again, like Bradley was saying. For those of us who, you know, beat the ridiculous amount of odds, because again, you can do push-ups all day, but then it's your coach, it's your playing time, it's the team, did they win? There's all these factors that are up in the air in terms of who gets noticed and who gets drafted. And then even if you do all that, injuries, just, just there's a whole host of things that allow for a short career. And then back to square one again, going back to, you know, where, where you started, right? So again, that, that 
develops dependency whereby I came from nothing and I'm so very nervous because everything is riding, all my eggs are in, the, in this one basket. Does it make sense? Is it rational for me to put everything on the line and protest? Now, if I have something to fall back on, you know, if I know that there's other alternatives, we have a family business or this, that, and the third, right? If I already have my degree, well, that changes my calculus. That changes my calculus, right? So the way the game is rigged is they prey upon the least, you know, uh, th those of us who are in uh, unfortunate positions, right? And this is where the, the psychological sharecropping continues. Same game, but different name. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ratchford. Can I respond to that? I, Absolutely. That's okay? Yes. Yeah, so if, if it's okay for me to just add a, my own conceptual frame, which I haven't been able to do this um, just yet tonight in my comments. Typically when we think about sport, what comes to mind are a few buzzwords. We think about meritocracy. So if you play hard enough, you're supposed to be rewarded for that. We think about sport as being a leisurely space, a fun space. Okay, we typically think of, or at least in terms of an imaginary sport, um, as a place that's supposedly apolitical. So all of these sorts of notions reinforce, I'm gonna use a buzzword, kind of a scholarly buzzword, it's sort of a teleology, a teleological way of thinking. So we had slavery, then we had segregation, and then we figured it out with integration. And what I do in my work is to push people, and I hope this is my research intervention, to think about sport as an actual production of knowledge, not just some leisurely random space that just came out of anywhere. Because I think this is incredibly important to think about sport as an exclusive space, as, an, as a space that has produced exclusive knowledge production. And I would argue actually that integration as a byproduct also produces exclusive knowledge production. Because what Dr. G, my good friend, one of my big brothers was talking about a little bit earlier, absolutely rings true in terms of we think about ownership. One thing that we do typically with integration is we only look at the physical component of it. We assume integration is a series of interpersonal interactions by people of difference in a physical space. And we brush our shoulders off like we've done something where we actually have done absolutely nothing or very little to nothing. And what we never do is investigate, I argue, the ideological underpinnings that frame those physical interactions of difference or inter physical interactions um, of people of difference, which I would argue are hegemonically or dominantly Eurocentric, which is embedded in a, a particular type of capitalism that reinforces the economic power of white men and white women, that it's racist and that it's sexist. And sometimes all three coalesce at the same time in concentric ways. We might look at the NBA as progressive now, but when Muhammad Abdul Rauf, who let me remind you, was one of the best point guards in the world in the mid 90s, he was not just some random person. This was someone that could have been on the second dream team. Look at his numbers. His numbers were as good as Penny Hardaway's. His numbers were as good as Gary Payton's. His numbers were as good as John Stockton. Those were the three point guards selected for the second dream team in 1996. He dropped 30 something, almost 40 points on the 96 Bulls team as a nugget, and they won that game. So this was not some ancillary player. He was out of the league shortly after his protest. So we have to think about why would he be out of the league shortly after? And I would argue, and I can give you a number of examples, this is just one that popped into my mind, that the structure, thinking about sport as a production of knowledge, integration as a byproduct of that, still to this day have been, and still to this day, are hegemonically Eurocentric, in a way that it embedded with a type of capitalism that reinforces the power of white men, or white people, our white brothers and sisters, races and sexes. As a, as a fundamental structural component, so if we're talking about structural and systemic, you should go back and read the comments by Russ Granick, David Stern. Muhammad Abdul Rauf is not supported by his black peers, widely supported. Go back and read what um, Jordan, Barkley, Kim Olajuwon certainly didn't support him. And these are people I grew up revering, okay? So uh, I just want to add that kind of conceptual framework to get us thinking about sport, not as just some random space that's just fun, but to actually take sport seriously as a, as a space that produces knowledge that I would argue aligns with the ways in which our nation state produces knowledge in an exclusive way. So I will, I will stop there. Thank you. Um, 
Uncle Carlos, I want to go back to you with a question really quick, um, and then we'll go back to uh, Dr. Ratchford, actually, with another question. But uh, Uncle Carlos, you talked about the traditional place of the football uh, center line and just the resistance to centering Black players or the assumption that Black players were somehow less capable uh, in terms of leadership within the team or just the centering of the white player as the leader. Can you share uh, any of your experience with that in your own career? Or uh, can you just talk about how or if you've seen that shift as time has gone by? Yes. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. So the shift started primarily in the 80s because colleges were not producing. Colleges wanted to win. And to win, they had to run. And to run, you had to have the best athletes. And in effect, more major colleges started having black quarterbacks. So basically, colleges were developing black quarterbacks and not developing white quarterbacks. Then it continued into the 90s and to now to where the top quarterbacks, if you take Tom Brady out of the mix, primarily – the up-and-coming young quarterbacks are all black quarterbacks um, that you see. Aaron Rodgers is still hanging on. Tom Brady's still hanging on. But the Mahomes and Cam should do well. But um, so I think that started changing because things changed on the college scene first. And then it became more acceptable that we could actually run a team. Then you started seeing – more black quarterbacks, more black middle linebackers, more black safeties. And because of the, the changing of the game and the speed of the game, you there weren't any white cornerbacks. And still now there are no white cornerbacks in the league because you have to cover black players, which are the fastest players on the field normally. Okay. So that's how the game developed. And that's what caused – the, the color change across the game and the mindset as far as who could run what. Things that I've seen personally myself, uh, when I was playing with the San Diego Chargers, we had a linebacker who was drafted high. And actually, uh, he came out and coming out, he was white, and coming out of the University of Arkansas, they thought so highly of him, they paid him more than Lawrence Taylor, who I consider the quintessential linebacker from 81 to 91. He dominated football, and he had to be accounted for on the field. Even to this day, 20 or 30 years later, everyone's trying to find the next Lawrence Taylor, and everyone's trying to find – find someone that dominant again in the sport. But he, he came out more than Lawrence. Lawrence didn't go to camp because he said, if you say I'm the greatest, who is he? How is he going to get paid more than me? He hasn't taken one snap yet. But what directly affected me was we would be in the huddle, and since he was the middle linebacker, they wanted him to make the calls. Well, I took pride always in playing football. I was always the captain. I all made, always made the calls from high school, college. And at this point, when I got into pros, they wanted this guy to make the calls. Well, he couldn't make the calls. He would make mistakes from the sideline. So I would look, and I would say, check, and I would make the call. So when we got to the sideline, the coach would say, what's going on out there? I said, he's he's messing up the calls. I'm making the calls. They went and had their little meeting with this gentleman and came right back and said, Carlos, continue making the calls. So on the surface, they wanted it to look like he was in charge where he wasn't even in charge, okay? There was another situation where because this player was, 
the highest paid defensive player on our team, he wasn't on the field during third and fourth down or second and third down, you know, half the down. So the news media wrote an article and said, if he's so important, why isn't he on the field? We go to practice the next week and we're running our defenses and the coach just told him to stand on the field. So we're the other 10 players, we're actually going through our assignments. He ended up saying, hey, coach, what do you want me to do? He said, I don't care what you do. They told us we had to have you out here. So they literally just put him on the field because they were forced to almost just to save face. So the highest paid defensive player is not the most valuable, is not making the most plays, but because his skin tone was what they wanted to look like it was the leadership at that time, that's what they allowed to happen. So I've seen it directly. Um, even when I was in college, I earned a starting position. The coach came up to me and said he was going to start somebody else because their parents came to see them in the game. They happened to be white. The coach happened to be Asian. I took complete offense to all of that, and I was glad I was able to make it to the pros so the gentleman that took my place that day could watch me as he did his dental work in New Jersey. That's it. You know, and I, I think that's such a powerful point because it goes to, for those of us who saw the documentary, the Jordan, Jerry Krause says something similar. He said, players don't win championships, organizations do. You know, and, and hear from right. Bradley's story, it's the players actually out in the field who are making the quick time decisions. And just so think about if more brothers had the opportunity to coach, what would happen? I mean, after all, it's a glaring disparity what's going on in the NFL and in the uh, NC2A in terms of the, the player ratio being mostly black compared to the amount of uh, head coaches who are black. And then of those head coaches who are black, those who have an opportunity to actually have longevity in their jobs and quote unquote make mistakes. I'm tired of hearing stories about Mike McCarthy, head coach of the Packers. He started off making copies and then all of a sudden he's a football coach. You know, like, wait, what? I mean, you know, I mean, how many brothers and sisters have played the game and, and, and have more knowledge in their pinky? But yet, again, we talk about where can you put your cup into? And this goes to the systemic and institutional barriers that often frustrate uh, black excellence outside of sports entertainment. Sister Carr, are you on mute? Can you yeah. hear me now? Okay, thank you. Uh, so this next question is going back to Dr. Ratchford um, and talking about patriotism in protest or rather po uh, protest as patriotism. Um, you spoke a lot earlier about um, the forced patriotism within the sports arena. Um, and we hear a lot about the narrative of protests in sports um, or kneeling and such representations of protest as being unpatriotic or, or un-American. Um, I feel like you linked the two things in a really interesting way during your presentation. So I'm curious about your view of the idea of of the sports arena serving as a place of uh, patriotism and how it links to protest and patriotism in the American na uh, narrative. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. There's a lot of ways we can go with this. I mean, I think one of the flip sides um, would be pertinent to someone like Stephen Ross, the owner of my terrible Miami Dolphins, um, who can openly, and he's not alone. I mean, who, who's thrown fundraisers for Donald Trump in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. He's not alone in doing that. There's someone like Nick Bosa, if you will, from the 49ers who can make anti-black comments without consequence. Even someone like Donald Trump, if you go back and look at articles from, I believe, around the Super Bowl this year, when the national anthem was played and he was conducting almost if, if it was his own choir, everyone was standing 
in a particular way to show respect in a particular kind of way that they understood respect or they understand respect. Um, and I don't say that with any criticism I, I, um, in terms of how they understand patriotism for themselves. But my point is these people can all make particular types of claims that are politicized that intersect sport, race, politics, and patriotism without any consequence. And they can make those kinds of comments, I would argue, because the structure of sport allows them to, as individuals, have the freedom to do so. And I can give you examples of this that go back into 1890s boxing. I, well, you have someone like a white Irish, uh, Irish American boxer like John Sullivan, um, who chose um, not to fight. The name's not coming to the Afro, Afro Australian boxer Jackson, um, Peter Jackson. He chose not to fight him because of the color of his skin. So we have going back to what Dr. G, Dr. Moreno, Mr. Bradley were kind of talking about in different ways in terms of race and, and debates on race and athletic superiority that's shifted over time, right? So at one period of time, um, white athletes would never step in the ring with black athletes because they were perceived to be inferior. But once they started to see that black athletes were successful, then they said, well, you know, of course they're successful, as Dean Cromwell, who was considered the maker of champions at USC, coached no multiple national championships, was considered an integrationist for coaching black athletes, but believed that the reason why black athletes were successful is because they were not too far removed from the jungles of Africa, where they were surrounded by animals on, the, on, the, on a daily basis. So juxtapose this kind of sentiment with someone like LeBron James, who's competed for Team USA, I think won three different medals, two different medals, but three different Olympiads, 2004, one bronze, 2008 and 2012. People that like Jackie Robinson, who was very different than Paul Robeson, both were fantastic athletes. Jackie Robinson was a patriot. So it doesn't matter if you serve in our armed forces. It doesn't matter if you compete for Team USA and bring home gold medals. If you don't subscribe to a particular type of what I call American knowledge production, you are labeled as an un American because as Americans, as I argue, we like nice, neatly packaged stories, right? I think American knowledge production is an incredibly powerful. We receive it. We will process it in a palatable way. That's why I mentioned George Washington. Go look at whitehouse.gov right now. Go look at Thomas Jefferson, whitehouse.gov right now, real time. You will not see anything about them as slaveholders. You will not see anything about them in terms of their views on um, anti-blackness, anti-black inferiority, because that's not a good story. That's not the story we want to tell, or that's not the and that's not the story that we process, allow ourselves to process in terms of what it means to be an American. I think all of this is incredibly important in terms of how we think about ourselves individually, collectively, and in terms of national identity formation. And I think we need to start taking sports seriously as a space that produces knowledge and not just some ancillary place that is just fun and we're just playing games. It's not just that. This is this is real stuff that's happening here. And people are forming real opinions in an anti-intellectual moment, have not read a book, have not read an article, have not taken a course, have opinions and believe their opinions are empirically sound evidence, empirically sound arguments, and don't know a damn thing about even the nation they live in that they claim to love. And this is the moment we're in right now that's coalescing all of this. So it's exciting to be in a sport of story right now. It's a little bit overwhelming, but it's exciting to be to be a sport of story. I don't know if I answered your question well or not. Um, it's kind of going in different directions, but uh, uh, thank you for answering, and I'd be happy to follow up if necessary. Well, thank you for that. And I think that's a powerful place for us to wrap up. Um, so we want to thank everyone that joined us for this panel this evening. Um, Mr. Bradley, Dr. Ratchford, Dr. Marino, Dr. G, thank you for your time and joining us and, and speaking into this important topic. Um, Ms. Bernadine, do you want to introduce the, the upcoming topic that'll be on the 23rd and then we can wrap up? Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our viewers. Uh, I think it's quite a bit funny. We talked about sports this evening and we went into overtime. Um, so perhaps we uh, may need to revisit this topic. Viewers, please reach out to us if you'd like to see a part two on this discussion. Uh, 
uh, get on the um, Southside Community Association uh, Facebook page and let us know. Uh, coming up on Sunday, the hot topic for uh, these last couple of days has been about Kamala Harris and how do we feel um, about this woman uh, being selected as uh, Mr. Biden's running partner uh, as she vies for Veep of these United States of America. So please join us on Sunday uh, for that uh, special broadcast. Um, as we end tonight's or this evening's broadcast, I'd like to leave everyone with the question, is slavery's legacy in the dynamics of sports? And think about that, think on it, and uh, reach out to us and let us know if we need to come back uh, with a part two on this discussion. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, our resident uh, facilitator. Uh, thank you, most of all, viewers. Uh, much love out there for Miss Deb, um, who's our boss. So good evening. Take care. Be happy. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Thank you. Peace and blessings.